Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them and how you can build it yourself. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about something that pretty much every single salesperson uh, is going to have to encounter frequently in their day to day. Um, And if they don't have a good way of addressing this particular issue that they're going to face time and time again, they're going to be nothing. They're going to be stuck. Uh, I'm your host, Sarah Hicks. And today on the Predictable Revenue Podcast, I'm going to be chatting to an expert about destroying objections like a neuro-linguistic programming expert. He's an author, speaker, trainer, and master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming. For the past 30 years, he's taught tens of thousands of people the power of language to persuade, sell, heal, turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones, and pain into passion. His speeches and trainings have motivated audiences around the world to discover their power to design their own results. Paul Ross, welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. Thank you for that incredibly warm welcome, Sarah. Uh, By the way, I wrote that introduction. (laughs) So if it's a big mouthful, that's my... That's my fault my doing and it really is an honor to be here today i do want to preface what i'm about to say that it is very challenging to the traditional way of doing sales and it is directed for everyone anyone can use it but it really is directed to those people who've taken every sales training out there but they're finding that people are just repeating the same thing and they're really ready for something new that they can't get off can't get from off the shelf and they're ready to crush their best day and maybe, you know, even crush the competition. (laughs) So that's what I'll be delivering. Perfect. Can't wait. That's definitely always what we're looking for. We love something a little polarizing, a little something out of left field, something that's that's going to rub people the wrong way. Let's do it. I love it. Let's do it. Turn it it all, every, every past methodology on its head and show people what they should be doing instead. Sure. So Paul, give us first a little context, a little background on where you came from and how you, how you landed where you are today. Right. Well, what's not in the bio, because I like to spring it on the hosts and therefore spring it on the audience, is I'm a former dating coach and I still do a little bit of it. So I came up through the ranks of NLP because I had to solve my own problem, which is I couldn't get a date to save my life. I was not always the handsome, gorgeous, silver fox specimen that you see before you. I was gangly awkward. I had no emotional intelligence and I just couldn't communicate. So I used NLP to learn how to get communication skills that made me attractive, uh, Mm. et cetera, et cetera. And I began to teach it to other guys. And what happened is over a course of time, I would get emails saying, thank you. I met my wife. Here's pictures of my kids. But you should know, Paul, I've been using this for sales. The same principles apply and I've been crushing it. I thought, wow dummy, go back into your lab and and see how you could tweak this. And in fact, if you think about about it, if I can push the analogy a little bit, a date is sort of like a sale. It could well be the most important sale you do. You have to do your prospecting. You have to do your sales, establish rapport, do your marketing presentation. Forgive me, go for the close, handle possible objections and There you go. So I think it's quite similar. Mm -hmm. And in the course of doing that, I also had to learn how to take people who are very deeply afraid of no and afraid of rejection because they had gotten it their whole adult life. So I've sort of mapped that over into sales because in sales, we're going to hear no, we're going to get rejected. And we really need to know how do we establish a consistent motivation, an intelligent motivation that's not dependent on the response of our prospects or the events of the day, or even how we might be feeling in the moment. And how can we get back on our feet, so to speak, metaphorically, when we get knocked off our pins? Mm -hmm. And that's what I really want to talk to to you about today. Because I come from outside that box of selling, I have insights that are pretty unique. Something that has something that stood out to me there and what you said was um, the idea that through neuro linguistic programming, you were able to basically increase your social intelligence, which is something Great so way. interesting to me, because I think there there has been a bit of a shift with the idea of the growth mindset that you're um, 
sort of your IQ, the, the sort of analytical and, you know, that type of intelligence is something that we can work on. It's like it, it's aptitudes and you can strengthen that. But I think we still have this potential misconception that the social intelligence is something that is fixed or that you're born with or that's a product of your tra- childhood. So, yeah, like how how did you come across the ability well, to sort of train Well, e- Well, EQ is really emotional uh, intelligence. Mm-hmm. And so to take guys, left brain guys who had none of it and to teach them how to have it in spades, so to speak, was a pretty magical thing. And yeah. so let me break down very, very briefly. I don't want to get into a deep dive into NLP, but NLP, which stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming, is essentially, in my view, in my practice, a way of looking into how language structures our consciousness and shapes our decisions. So let me give you just the metaphor. One of the things that will help people when they go to do sales, because I see sales with a completely different orientation. I think the first thing you should ask yourself is what states of consciousness, what states of mind do I want my prospect in so they receive my message? And I'll unpack that for you, Sarah. This is just a metaphor, and it's not a trick question. Suppose I want to conduct a current of electricity. I have a sheet of gold foil and a sheet of cardboard. Mm. It's not a trick question. Which one is going to conduct the electricity? The foil. Exactly. So think of the state of mind that your prospects are going to be in as being that either the cardboard of being bored, skeptical, overrun, overstimulated, cynical, or the gold foil of not only being in rapport, but unconsciously believing that you're a powerful leader of wanting to listen, of being totally focused in on what you have to say. And I'm going to say this because I'm also a hypnotist of being suggestible. How do we create those states before we go with our facts, figures, data? Because one of the big mistakes a lot of salespeople do is they're so focused on their marketing plan and presenting the facts, figures, data, their unique selling proposition, which you have to do, that they don't first stop and think, oh, what state of mind do I want my prospect or prospects to be in? such that they receive all of that. They receive the USP, they receive all of that unique selling proposition, facts, data, through that state of consciousness. So the idea that selling is about creating states of consciousness, not just in your prospects, but in yourself. What state do you want to be in when you go to sell? And I think there's a lot of myths that are taught that don't work if you want to be a champion. They work if you want to do well. If you want to be a champion, there's some myths, I think, that really have to be busted. And we'll do that in this, I almost said seminar. I I think (laughs) I love teaching. So every podcast episode is sort of a mini seminar for me. It is, absolutely. Okay, well, let's, let's get into it. The very first thing I'd love to hear from you is what is your maybe like baseline definition or what is your idea of a great objection handle? Great response to an objection. Well, before I do that, before I give the technique, I need to give the basic principle and the basic idea, if I could. Absolutely. And I can do that best with a metaphor, with a story, with an illustration, if I might. So back when I was a dating coach, I didn't like to take guys out into the field, so to speak. It was just annoying. But I had a customer call me up. He said, I'll give you $10,000 in cash. I said, I'm convinced. Come on over. He dumps it in my lap. I said, let's go. We go to a local restaurant that has an outdoor patio area. Are you following me? I am. And I proceed to watch this guy crash and burn. He didn't just crash and burn. It was so bad. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of being embarrassed for someone else's failures, but I felt that bad. And after 90 minutes, to his credit, he didn't care. He kept charging forward. But I thought, we're either going to get kicked out or he's going to get beaten up. Let's get out of here. Now, here comes the illustrative part of the story. So we're standing in the parking lot about half an hour after midnight. And just 20 feet away, I see a lovely lady. And I say, look, there's a lovely lady waiting for her cat. Now, sir, for some reason, it went in the wrong way. And she got furious. Her face turned red. The veins on her temples bulged out. She began to scream at me with things that would make a sailor 
turn pale. <laughs> Things about putting parts of my anatomy into other parts of my anatomy with that were physiological, physiologically <laughs> impossible. It was awful. My student went to get to charge at her. I put my arm out. I said, no, look at her. She's someone's sister. She's someone's daughter. She's someone's best friend somewhere. She's deeply loved. And there was a second of confusion on her face. And then she burst into tears. She came running over to me, threw her arms around me saying, I'm so, so sorry. That's the most loving thing anyone has ever said to me. I feel so much love in my heart for you right now. Um, it's not your fault. Guys are being vulgar to me. Mm -hmm. What's your name? And I said, I'm Mr. Wonderful. We got to go. <laughs> What's the point of that story? The point of that story is this. I interrupted her pattern. Her expected pattern of response to that mm -hmm. kind of situation would be either that I would yell back at her and get into a fight, that I would apologize or that I would slink away. I didn't do any of those things. I stood my ground and I stayed neutral. I interrupted her pattern. So here's mm -hmm. the first principle when you're dealing with objections. People respond and act and behave with fixed and sometimes very rigid patterns of thinking, behaving, feeling, responding. When you break those patterns, people become very suggestible and very easily led. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I stood on that firm foundation of having that recognition. The second thing is notice what I didn't do. I didn't make it about me. I didn't think there's something wrong with me. I didn't think this is my fault. I simply observed that this has got nothing to do with me. And that's because of another belief I have, which is I seldom take a prospect's negative responses written in stone. It's almost always a reflection of what they're thinking, feeling, or believing in that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's almost always subject to change. So I had that in addition to having that realization and model that people behave in fixed patterns, I have that belief that I don't take their first negative responses written in stone. That's number one. Number two, I didn't make it about her. I didn't think to myself, she's awful. She's, I didn't, in my mind, I won't use filthy language. Uh, I didn't think she was the B word or any of that. I just saw her as a human being in pain. I thought she's in pain. And rather than feel hurt, she's channeling it into anger because mm -hmm. when we're angry, we at least have the illusion that we're at cause instead of at effect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And number three, notice what I didn't do. I didn't stay in rapport with her. What would have happened had I stayed in rapport with her when she was angry? I would have had to match her anger. So rapport at the wrong time can destroy your sale. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Instead of, and I didn't feel tremendous amounts of empathy for her either. If I was empathizing with her, I would feel what she was feeling and I'd lose my emotional leadership. And sales is very much about emotional leadership. Instead, I had compassion for her, which means I saw where she was at without having to go there for myself. This is a core skill that champion salespeople need to have. If you're really good, you don't need it. But if you want to be a champion and crush your best day, here's the skill. The ability to see where your prospect's at without having to go there for yourself. Yeah. So if you, all the things we're taught about, you have to stay in strong rapport and you must always empathize with your client. I say, wait a minute, that is true to some extent. But when, you come, when it comes to destroying objections, you need to break rapport. I know that sounds crazy. What break rapport? That's that's completely blasphemous. But in fact, as that story illustrates, it's true. Now you get rapport back very quickly. Here's another secret. When you break rapport and get it back, once you get it back, the rapport is even stronger. Mm. So rapport, break rapport, and then strong rapport. Again, this is kind of off the wall. But I'll illustrate with specific examples as we go further. Is this overwhelming or am I? No, it's not. I, I do have a couple of uh, follow-up questions. So Yes, please. My first is um, when you are 
interrupting that pattern or you're breaking that rapport. Uh, is there a rule that you should follow with how you go about that? So for in the instance where we're talking about this, this woman who was angry, you broke it with calm, sort of the opposite of, of the, the emotion that she was projecting. I broke it with something unexpected. So I broke it with being unexpected. Okay. But second, I stayed neutral. Neutrality can, is much more important than enthusiasm when you're handling objections. If you're too enthusiastic, you could come off as being desperate for the deal. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I stayed neutral. Okay. So it's, it's not, the demeanor is neutral, but it's rather, right. it's the words then that are, are where you're throwing somebody off or, or interrupting the pattern. It's with what exactly. you choose to, to respond with. Okay. Yes. But that's also based on some other elements. One of the elements was I knew how to keep, and I'm going to use a sloppy term. I knew how to keep my energy grounded. So I was, I could, I felt, and I teach my students and my trainees this. I teach them how to put 20% of their attention on the feeling of their feet on the ground. And I teach them to breathe from the belly. So that keeps you out of fight or flight. Mm -hmm. So there's a physiology aspect to this too. So there's a cognitive aspect where you have these beliefs and these attitudes that it's not about you and it's not about them and that people behave in fixed patterns. But there's also a physiological bit that you use your body in the right way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, my other question was around uh, making, bringing that person into this suggestible mindset. So identifying the mindset that you'd like them to be in so that they conduct rather than repel Correct. whatever you're trying to throw their way. Correct. Um, how do you know when somebody is in that suggestible place or mindset? Because they they open up and they open up and give me information I otherwise wouldn't have. And they also become far more attentive. You'll, you'll see them completely focus in on you. It almost is creating a, a semi trance state because it's so, there's so much suggest, suggestion going on. But let me, let's, can I give you a concrete example to your audience? For sure. Because we're talking in a lot of theory, and I love theory being a, something of an egghead. But let's give you a, an example. Let's say the person says, I need more time to think it over. This is a common objection. So I do what I call a counterexample. So role play with me. Just say, I need more time to think it over. I need more time to think it over. Hey, I understand, but can I ask you, have you ever had the experience of taking a long time to think something over and it still turned out to be a bad decision. Yep. Maybe it's not about time, but about the clarity you need to recognize a great decision can be made. So thinking about it just like that, what steps do we need to take to make sure you can see you want to move forward with this? Mm -hmm. Do you get it? So what I'm doing with that reframe is I'm saying that very thing that you're telling me you need to do is the thing that will lead you to the bad outcome that you want to avoid. Mm. It takes the objection and just pretty much erases it. Mm -hmm. It's like you're these, these smoke screen objections that people throw up that are yes. not really the right. root of the problem. Right. You're getting and I, down to exactly. that. Exactly. And I think most objections are smoke screens. I don't think most prospects know what their true objections are. And also, no prospect wants to say, I don't understand this or I'm confused because then they're going to look stupid. So in effect, we're giving them permission. We're breaking their pattern. We're getting them to think in a new direction. And we're also giving them permission to really open up and put out on the table what needs to be, sh what needs mm -hmm. to be there. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that most of the time prospects are just not going to tell you what the problem is because they don't know. Yeah. Unless you're dealing with very sophisticated investors. Someone, I'm doing a training with someone who does large, large multifamily real estate investment. He helps investors. He finds investors and gets them a pool of investors in huge units, residential apartment units. Someone like that who's a very sophisticated investor it may or may not work with them. Right. Okay. So you have to look in context. Okay. 
And do you think the best way to do this reframe is like you did in that example with a, an open-ended question or with a question that that asks them something well, about it's their not, reflection? Well, it's not, uh, let's be clear, Sarah, it's not really a question about the intended to elicit facts about the objection. It's a question designed to erase the objection by reframing it, by interrupting it. Mm -hmm. So when I say, when they say, I need more time to think it over, and I say, well, have you ever taken a long time to think something over and it still turned out to be a bad decision? Suddenly their mind goes, there's almost a stutter there, what I call the unconscious stutter. It's designed to get them to drop the objection so they become malleable, so they become leadable, so they become suggestible. And then I can lead them into a place where they feel they have permission to tell me what's really going on. If you can't get the objection out on the table, the real objection, you're just not going to make the deal. You'll be forced to push. Mm -hmm. And when we push, we know what happens. We lose. You'll be forced mm -hmm. to push or plead. You don't want to do that. Or pound sand. So push, plead, pound sand. We don't want to do any of those things. Cool. So one of the, the way that you um, mentioned the, or kind of explained the reframe there is that we are saying that very thing that you're worried about or, or that you want in this situation could be the thing that in fact leads you to the bad situation. So you're saying like that would be a poor choice, whereas something else would be a better choice. Tell me more about how you reframe and reposition um, whatever piece you're trying to get out of them. Right. Well, notice, and this is very powerful. You see, one of my rules is you're never selling your product or service. You're always selling decisions and good feelings about decisions. You can think of yourself, if you want, as a decision service technician. That's a good reframe, by the way, for people who have to sell but don't love doing it. Personally, I love doing it because I know how to make it fun. Mm -hmm. So notice what I did there. When I answered that objection, I didn't give a factual answer to the objection. What I did is I was vague. I implied, I didn't state, Sarah, that if you do things your way, you're going to lose, did I? I didn't directly say, well, if you take your time to think about this, you're going to come to a bad decision and you're going to lose. If I say it directly, they're going to tell me, but if I imply it, mm -hmm. then their own imagination, their own subconscious mind will come up with a correct understanding. This is another rule I have. Whatever you can get your prospect to imagine by themselves will be perceived by them as being their own thought, and therefore they will not reject, reject it or resist it. So by being vague and by implying things, the prospect can't come to their own conclusion that, oh yeah, it's not about time, I better not hesitate. If I say it directly, then they're gonna tell me to take a hike a long walk on a short pier. Mm -hmm. So learning to imply things and also drop in suggestions is very, very powerful. I dropped in a suggestion at the end of that. Can I go through it with you again? Yeah. Well, I, I said, have you ever had the experience of taking a long time to make a decision and it still turned out to be the wrong thing to do? Then I said, maybe it's not about time but about the clarity you need to recognize a great decisions being made. That's a suggestion, a vague suggestion, a great decisions being made. Did I say a great decision to sign a contract is being made? No. No, I was vague. And because I was vague, the unconscious mind, the subconscious mind is always searching for meaning. Our subconscious minds are meaning making machines. Wow, meaning-making machines. It's another <laughs> uh, tongue twister. And so it's uh, our subconscious is always searching for meaning. When we're vague like that, it will come up with a meaning that best fits the situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm always dropping one tool after the other. I'm never content to rest. I want to establish that I am the emotional leader that can take them by the hand and draw them to making the right decision. But sometimes, sometimes you have to point them away from where they're going and basically imply to them that they could lose. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in pushing down hard on pain buttons, but the fact of the matter is, 
our press picks do have pain points. Absolutely. I have another question. So if, um, when applying this reframe uh, strategy to an objection, do you find that there are different ways that you can appeal to different types of people? Like, is there a certain personality type that one thing works with versus another? Or is it a more of a universal tactic? I think it's universal. Now, the follow-up with certain kinds of people has to be different. If they're super analytical, then you have to present all the facts, data, and figures. But if you present, if you say, if let's say you're dealing with someone who's super analytical and they say, well, I need more time to think it over and you use my objection crusher, that will open them up. Yeah, they'll be willing to have another look, but you better have your facts, data, and figures prepared. Mm-hmm. One of the common mistakes that traditional sales trainings teach is they don't teach you that it's powerful to be vague at the right time. In sales, there's absolutely a time to be totally clear on your proposition, to know your numbers, your unique selling proposition, but there's also a time to be vague and to be and to use suggestion. And knowing when to alternate back and forth between these two things will make you a superstar. It'll take your best day and allow you to laugh at it. So uh, give me some more examples of these scripts. I loved, I loved the, yes. the example that you gave. Give us some more. What, some more of these kind of common um, so with Budget. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not looking to spend money on a new solution right now. Uh, there's a reframe that I would use something along the lines of, well, what you haven't yet recognized is with the right solution, you're not spending money. You're investing in the growth of your company. Mm. So it's a reframe. Instead of talking about spending, you talk about investing. I've trained a lot of real estate brokers, and you certainly don't have to be in real estate to do this. But oftentimes, the objection they get is, I don't want to pay a big commission. And I teach my my brokers to say, well, Mr. Smith, with the right agent, you're not paying a commission. You're investing in skills. So it's a little bit of a meaning reframe. Does Mm -hmm. that mean they're immediately going to buy right away? No. And the whole budget objection is usually just BS anyway. Yeah. They obviously don't see the value in right. what you're providing. So, right. Yeah. They, they don't yet see the value. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. I'm trying to think of some of the other really common ones. So, what about when somebody just hits you with the like, more, give me more information? You know, I'll, I'll think about this. Just, just shoot me an email with some more information instead of talking about it right now. Again, I would do the same thing. I would say, have you ever taken a long time to think something over and it still turned out to be a bad decision? Yes, we could go ahead and do it your way, but do you really want to get this opportunity to get lost in all the noise of your day to day of your day to day interactions and activities? Yeah. Because look, this is nowadays one of your biggest competition, one of your biggest barriers to success. Because people are distracted. We have instant mess. My brother, for the first time in his life, got his first cell phone. He said to me, Paul, the other night we were talking, he said, I'm addicted. I can't stop texting. <laughs> <laughs> so people are distracted and they're they have the attention span of goldfish. Right. Well, you know, that's that actually it totally makes sense. And that's a great transition to this next piece I wanted to talk about, which is about the changing landscape of business and sales. Um, so you mentioned, of course, there are a ton of traditional sales methodologies that have all of their pretty similar ways of objection handling, and not a lot of them touch on this, the reframe, the suggestiveness, the, the um, yeah, a couple of those other things you suggested. So how, why do you think this does so much better than a lot of those because it's appealing first of all let me just make something clear i don't want to knock everything that's out there there are a lot of good sales trainings as someone said to me though he he runs a call center i did a training for his call center he said i've taken i've taken every training out there but this is unique Uh, uh, i've never seen anything like this i think the the unique thing and the thing that other sales trainings have been lacking is the appeal to the subconscious mind. So if you're doing something, by the way, that's working great, I'm not here to tell you to stop doing it. Just notice the results increasing as you throw in the power of suggestion and suggestive language. 
and just watch for yourself. Just see for yourself. This is why I never, ever ask anyone to buy anything from me out of the shoot because it is so different. My whole philosophy is give a ton of stuff away. Let people go out and make money from the free stuff because I could say it's guaranteed. I could give you testimonials, but the best proof is your own results. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. And do you think that there is any influence on, on this, these strategies that you have in the remote sales world of today, or is it equally? Well, useful? let's talk about remote. Let's yeah. talk about remote. Uh, this call center I train does outbound telemarketing and that's difficult to do. They, it's a center. What they do is they sell qualified leads to contractors. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and they're in the Philippines. So it's really, really difficult for two reasons. Number one, phone sales can be very difficult, but number two, they sound like they're in a call center and it sound as you've had calls from call centers. And what do you think as soon as you hear it? Call, telemarketer, spam. Telemarketer, bam, forget yeah. it. So I taught them a reframe, a reframe for an unspoken objection. Although sometimes it's spoken when they call and their, their English is perfect in the Philippines. It does have a slight accent. So you can tell mm -hmm. they, they oftentimes like 40% of the time we'd get this objection. Is this a call center? Oh, you're calling from a call center. And I taught them a, a great pattern interrupt. I taught them to say, well, as a matter of fact, sir, I am part of a dedicated service team. Thank you for noticing. Mm -hmm. You're yeah, laughing. Like positive. At, yeah, you spin it right into a positive mm -hmm. because there are three very powerful words. My book mm -hmm. is Subtle Words That Sell. Well, there are three subtle, powerful words. Dedicated service team. Dedicated is a positive emotional charge word, right? Mm -hmm. Service. Dedicated uh, service is a has got a very powerful emotional charge. Team. Team has got a powerful positive emotional charge. So here's a rule for being persuasive on the unconscious level. When you use three words that have a powerful positive charge, the unconscious, the subconscious, I use the terms interchangeably, has to, has to, has to switch its meaning that it, that it attaches to. It has to give you and look at you through a positive frame. So I did that for them. That was the number one thing that I did is to get them past that, hmm. past that objection. So yes, this applies to remote selling as well, because you're still dealing with human beings and they still have an unconscious mind that dreams at night. Mm -hmm. So dealing with people through the power of suggestion is still going to work. Interesting. I really like that idea of the three positively charged words right. and how that it completely, I'm waiting to see his numbers. He's keeping, I, I did the training last month. So he's going to report the numbers at uh, beginning or middle of next week. So we can see how the numbers shifted. There were a couple yeah. other things I did that are proprietary to that training. But mm -hmm. suffice it to say that you would agree that's Sarah, that's remote selling. Oh yeah. 110%. There's nothing more, more difficult and more remote about about a call center. And um, that's, it's interesting too, because you've sort of brought us full circle to the, the mindset um, topic that we had right at the beginning, where it's not just about getting your prospect in the suggestible mindset, but about having your kind of strong, grounded, neutral mindset. And somebody who is working at a call center, who is like bashed with that same objection a hundred times, will get on the phone and go like, ugh okay, I hope this person doesn't go like, is this a call center? Because ugh, you, I don't really know how to get the, around that. You hit the nail on, you hit the right on the button. <laughs> because the other thing I taught them is a lot about mindset. How do you stay focused and how do you stay in the right frame of mind when you hear, no matter what, five hangups in a row? Yeah. How do you do it? Well, I teach them that same story about the lady who was screaming at me. And it's a good metaphor for staying neutral. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is I totally reframe doing outbound calls. I say, you're not doing sales calls. You're doing opportunity outreaches. Mm -hmm. Now that may seem like a minor little play on words, but it's a big one mm -hmm. because when you do a sales call, what does it imply about who has the value? Yeah. 
who's who's got the value if you're doing a, a sales call the that that person it has all the money that you're trying to get so right. they have the power right. and, exactly yeah. like you're begging for change yeah. but when you do an opportunity outreach then yeah. who has the value you I have like it. that yeah yes so i taught them to reframe it that way yeah, absolutely. I think that that piece is huge for SDRs making cold calls because there I, is this fear about. Right. And and I also taught them is to not have a pumped up positive mindset. The problem with that pumped up positive mindset is number one, it's draining. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of work. Number two, it's hard to maintain. But number three, if you're all pumped up like Tony Robbins in front of 30,000 people and the person on the other end of the line isn't, they're going to think you're a maniac and they're going to hang up. Yeah, so true. So that is just a, a, a there's a whole bunch. We could do five podcasts on mindset because it's a mm -hmm. big part. Remember, let me do a callback. I started out as a dating coach yeah. and I had to teach these guys how to really maintain uh, motivation in the face of lots of uncomfortable new ways of talking and acting mm -hmm. and also in the face of getting some pretty brutal no's. There's no no more, if you don't know how to handle it, more personal than a rejection Mm -hmm. when it comes to asking for a date oh yeah or being friend zoned <laughs> oh yeah that, that's that is personal that i is, know it's very personal that is about so you. <laughs> that's very personal so if i can take guys who are very socially impacted and train them up to have a consistent mindset that keeps them going then i can take a sales team that's already pretty well performing and teach them how to do it compared mm. to they're much easier it's much easier task. Yeah. They already come with a sort of base baseline skill in that exactly. area. Exactly. <laughs> Versus some of my old students were like 40, 50 years old and never had a date in their life. Wow. Wow. So interesting. Yeah. This this idea of the the neutrality, I think, is so interesting and so important because there's so much there's more power in neutrality than there is in showing your hand, whether it be anger, whether it be excitement to kind of stay grounded, as you mentioned, with 20% of your conscious in your in your feet and and staying neutral, you won't get you're not being blustered around kind of at the mercy of everything that's happening to you as a salesperson. And and this is where I'm contrarian. I'm looking at I'm not looking at traditional doctrine because I didn't come from the traditional field. I'm simply saying again, try this on. Mm -hmm. Don't take my word for it. Try it on. Get uh, at the end. I'll tell them how they get a complete free training course, just Great. totally free. Don't I, I? don't expect anyone to want to hire me or do anything until they see the free stuff. Share it with your team. Let your team go through it and see what happens. Yeah, I'm that, absolutely. It's something that I'm going to take straight back to my team first thing in the morning tomorrow and and give it a go because it is something that comes up time and time again with SDRs, new season, whoever. It is always something that you're up against is handling the rejection, handling the objections. And um, of course, we have a brilliant framework here for reframing that objection, getting to the heart of what is actually the issue because then you can position an alternative. Um, but then of this great mindset um, and it's kind of beyond just a mindset, but it's like a whole existence that uh, will will set you up better for those cold calls. Thank you. I'll give you another. Can I give away a gold nugget, a freebie? Who who would I be? I'm going to give this. I again. <laughs> okay, this is going to sound new age or spiritual, whatever it is. But I also teach one more thing, which is after they get the nastiest call, pause for a second, take a breath, and say. Thank you for showing up as my teacher and my motivator and my guide. I wish prosperity on you, bless you and release you with love. If you do that, if you bless every, just take a second to do it. If you take a pause to breathe and thank that person that's showing up as your teacher, mm -hmm. your motivation, motivator and your guide, bless you. I release you with love. That's a crazy idea, the idea that you can add a spiritual element. And I don't want to offend people. If you believe in a higher power, if you believe in God, do channel it however way you want. Um, the great rabbi from Galilee said, bless those who treat you poorly. I forget the exact words. So uh, he had some good things to say. Right. So like um, 
kind of putting again a positive spin on a negative potentially negative situation yeah. so that it you don't kind of sit with it as a negative but rather reframe it make it positive let it go and move forward right and if you really think about it sometimes we do learn our best lessons from the people who who treat us the most poorly if we know how to do it now there's one more element that i think is unique to what i'm teaching and I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm blowing my own horn. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm tamping it down and being a lot less bragged, bringing a lot less braggadocio to this interview on the suggestion of my coach. <laughs> Is if you can take on the mindset that at the end of the day, we're all essentially in the same boat. This again is what I call compassion confidence. At the end of the day, that prospect, if you think about it, what were they wearing the minute they were born? Not a whole lot. What were what was I? What were you wearing the moment you were born? Not a whole lot. <laughs> and one day something's gonna happen to both of us. We're gonna stop breathing. In between those two days, we're all confused. The world is spinning. Mel Brooks said this, the famous comedian and, and actor. He said, look, the world is spinning. People are dizzy. They're trying to figure it out. At the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to figure it out. I'm not saying love, 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 or always enjoy it when you're rejected. But at least at the end of the day, if you can take on that mindset that we're all in the same boat and don't take it seriously, keep your frame process oriented and uninvested and wield those twin swords of humor and outcome independence. If you're taking things seriously, then you're, sh you're shot in the foot from the very, very beginning. You can be thorough and disciplined without being serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that is a wonderful place to wrap up. I'd love for you to tell me a little bit more about that free course. Yeah, here's what you do. If um, all you need to do to get the course, which is focused on destroying objections, that's what it's about. But there's also uh, another free course on mindset and then a little audio training about some techniques I used since I'm nine years old that made me a lot of money. <laughs> all you have to do is email me, Paul at Speaker Paul Ross, and put the subject free. Here's one th thing that's required. There's one thing that is required. I want you to tell me one takeaway you got from this interview right. all right so if you want that you want that free course that i think you can go within a period of a few days run out and see results with it just send me an email paul at speaker paul ross subject subject line free the only requirement is you say one takeaway that you got from this broadcast that's it fair does that sound fair totally fair more than fair and I'll send you your copy as, of course, um, because you. you were kind enough to have me on your show. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to, to bring it to my, my prospectors and see what they get out of it, because certainly I have learned sure. a whole lot. Um, a ton of these things would have been massively helpful for me when I was prospecting myself, so I really can't wait um, to have them listen to the episode and try it out themselves. Um, if people want to learn more from you about anything else beyond, beyond the free courses, how can they get in touch with you? Again, email me. I'm uh, look. I love talking to people. I love the interactions. I read. I I have assistants, but they don't look at my. I am the only person who looks at the emails. Just email me and put the subject talk, Perfect. and tell me what you want to talk about. And I'm happy to talk. And and I always like to do email first because it's it's safer and people don't. You know, I could be. I think. I don't think I'm intimidating, but I've been told by coaches that hey, you're this master salesperson, you're a hypnotist. People are going to be afraid to talk to you. So offer. I, you don't find me scary, do you? No, no. But I've got a lot no. of practice. I've I've been been meeting people from all over the place since I was basically completely underqualified to do the podcast. So I think I've really, <laughs> <laughs> I've a I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, I love Paul, it. thank you so much. It was really wonderful having you on the show. What a wonderful um, podcast. Thank episode. you. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you to all of you guys for listening to another episode. We will catch you next week. Bye-bye.